Well, welcome to or welcome back to the 510 Report, where we talk about industry news, advocacy, and general goings on. Thank you so much for joining me again. I got two stories that I wanted to talk about today. First story has to do with our own Food and Drug Administration, just kind of picking up right where we left off, I guess. Except now we have a new temporary FDA commissioner that I haven't got to know yet on social media. But just this last Tuesday, the FDA announced that the Philip Morris Ultria Heat Not Burn product called Icos has passed the PA. MTA process and has been cleared for sale in the United States. FDA Tobacco Product Director Mitch Zeller in a statement said, while the authorization of new tobacco products doesn't mean they are safe, the review process makes certain that the marketing of the product is appropriate for the protection of public health, taking into account the risks and benefits to the population as a whole. The FDA as a whole more or less praised the ICOS, saying that the ICOS contains fewer toxic chemicals than cigarette smoke and many of the toxins identified are present at lower levels than in cigarette smoke. Altria didn't give an exact timeline, but said that they'll be launching the Icos along with Marlboro branded tobacco sticks for use in the Icos in the city of Atlanta sometime soon. And of course, anti-tobacco groups are against this, saying heat not burn products are just the latest ploy from big tobacco to hook people onto its products. Why is it that anti-tobacco groups can't quite grasp the concept of harm reduction? This isn't some new radical way of thinking. So here's my takeaway from this news. It doesn't surprise me really in any capacity that a big tobacco company, which is still selling tobacco, was the first to pass the PMTA process. All government governments and big tobacco have a very cozy relationship based on money and tobacco taxes. And of course, individual states have that sweet, sweet MSA money as well, which none of them seem to be spending it on what it was intended for. I'll put a link down in the description that'll explain the MSA master settlement agreement a little bit better and a little bit more in depth. And the MSA is something that frequently, frequently comes up as the topic of conversation whenever anybody is discussing tobacco control. States are supposed to be spending this MSA Master Settlement Agreement on anti-tobacco campaigns and public health campaigns. Unless you're Alaska where you spent $3.5 million of that Master Settlement Agreement money on shipping docks, or North Carolina where they spent $42 million of the MSA Master Settlement Agreement money on tobacco farmers for modernization and marketing. With the ICOS product, people are still buying tobacco to use in it, so states will still get tobacco tax revenue and be able to bolster their MSA position showing more tobacco sales in order to receive bigger payments through the MSA from Big Tobacco that they can then spend not on public health. Many people across social media were very upset at this news of the ICOS getting a PMTA and I'll be honest, the first time I heard this news, I was irritated as well. But at the end of the day, the ICOS is harm reduction. So I'm not upset that Philip Morris Altria gets to sell the ICOS in the United States. It will be a net benefit to public health. I guess what upsets me the most is because it is Philip Morris Altria, we now have Mitch Zeller suddenly singing the praises of tobacco harm reduction. Whereas just a few months ago, Mitch Zeller and FDA Tobacco launched and continue to push the real cost campaign, telling smokers that vaping is just as bad as cigarettes and that nicotine is a brain poison. Quite the transparent 180 there, Mr. Zeller. Most of the FDA's current statements are absolutely correct. The ICOS, as well as liquid-based vapor products do contain fewer chemicals than cigarette smoke. And many of the toxins identified are present at much, much lower levels than cigarette smoke. The FDA is essentially saying here what the Royal College of Physicians and Public Health England have been saying publicly since 2016. Vapor products are 95% less harmful than cigarette smoke. But because the ICOS uses actual tobacco and therefore keeps that status quo of tobacco money intact, it is suddenly worthy of praise. Despite the fact that smoking rates in the United States are still at the lowest point they have ever been due to all of the 
other vapor products on the market that aren't the Icos. Interestingly enough, despite the most recent comments made by Mitch Zeller and our good old buddy Scott Godlib on the relative risks of the Icos products, Altria is still forbidden to make any modified risk claims about their product. They cannot claim that the Icos is any different than traditional combustible tobacco cigarettes, even though the science says otherwise. If the FDA had lived by their mission statement of protecting consumers and enhancing public health by maximizing compliance of FDA regulated products and minimizing risk associated with those products, I feel like reduced harm vapor products would have been getting praised a long time ago by the FDA instead of being painted as the next big health panic. But apparently it's not a health panic if it's a Philip Morris product. And with this announcement, the next few months of tobacco control are going to be insanely interesting. I mean, what does this mean for places like San Francisco where they're trying to ban all vapor products citywide? Will the ICOs get a free pass since the city will be recollecting those tobacco taxes from this product? It will be really interesting to see if all this vape hysteria was really inspired by protecting the kids, or if when it's all said and done, cities and states really did just want that tobacco tax money flowing again. Of course, I would love to get all of your thoughts down in the comments below. Now shifting gears just a little bit from that, the second thing I wanted to talk about today has to do with the CPSC, or the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Peter Feldman, the commissioner of the CPSC, tweeted out recently, I'm told that as much as 100% of liquid nicotine containers do not fully comply with the requirements of the Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act, including the use of flow restrictors. That's why today I requested US CPSC issue and enforce an immediate stop sale order. The Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act was the first actual vape law signed into law by then President Obama. And all it does is mandate that any e-liquid be sold in containers with child-proof caps. Because the vape industry was already self-regulating and only selling liquid nicotine in containers with child-proof packaging, this act was seen as an easily compliant rule that actually made sense. But what the CPSC did recently and quietly was amend that act to include the language restricted flow, which apparently zero of the millions of bottles of e-liquid currently in circulation in the United States currently implement. The amendment to the existing guidelines was only added in March of this year, and moving forward, all liquid bottles will need to be tested by a third party to ensure they are meeting the standards of restricted flow, at which point new certificates of conformity will be given from the manufacturers to the retail vape location so that they can be in compliance with this law. Vendors and shop owners are already sharing stories of inspections by CSPC agents. As reported by Vaping360.com, in at least one case, a vape shop owner said that a CPSC inspector demanded that all non-compliant bottles be dumped out on the spot. And now, believe it or not, this is where things get really sideways. The FDA and the CPSC have conflicting agendas. According to the FDA deeming rule, manufacturers are pro prohibited from changing their packaging with the exception of labels on all products that were on the market pre-August 8th 2016. Any alteration to the product, including a new bottle, means that that deemed product is now non-compliant and would be subject to the requirements of a PMTA before it can legally be sold again. So manufacturers and vape shops are now being forced to either be compliant with the FDA and their deeming rule or be compliant with the CPSC and the Child Nicotine Poisoning Prevention Act. And yes, this is what happens when government bureaucracy takes precedent over reason and public health. If both government agencies enforce their separate rules, then the open, independent vapor industry would be leveled in a matter of months. There's actually no way to comply with both and complying with one of them means not complying with another one. I said this first, I think back in 2010, and I'm gonna say it again now, the government isn't going to ban vaping. The government is just going to make it as expensive and difficult to access as possible 
for as long as they can. And I think that's where we're gonna end this 510 report today. Of course, as always, I'd love to get your thoughts down in the comments below. I can't end this 510 report without also mentioning Casa.org. It's free and easy to sign up. All you need is an email if you wanna know about possible negative vape legislation coming up in your particular city, area, or state. Casa.org. Join and follow those calls to actions. And remember, friends, you don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Let's advocate and let's be activists. <music>